fragrance that you will smell, you will never be able to smell this way again. It's a fragrance called Beyond Paradise, which you can find in any store in the nation, except here it's been split up in parts by Estee Lauder and by the perfumer who did it, uh, Kelly Becker, and I'm most grateful to them for this. And it's been split up in successive bits and accords. So what you're smelling now is the top note. And then will come what they call the, heart, the, the, the lush heart note. I will show it to you. The Eden top note is named after the Eden project in the UK. The lush heart note, uh, Metaleuca bark note, which does not contain any Metaleuca bark because it's totally uh, forbidden. And after that, the complete fragrance. Now what you are smelling is a combination of, I asked how many molecules there were in there and nobody would tell me. So I put it through a GC. Uh, a gas chromatograph that I have in my, in my office, and it's about 400. Um, so what you're smelling is several hundred molecules uh, 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 floating through the air, hitting your nose, and um, do not get the impression that this is very subjective. You are all smelling pretty much the same thing, okay? Smell has this reputation of being um, somewhat you know, different for each person. It's not really true, and perfumery shows you that can't be true, because if it were like that, it wouldn't be an art. Okay, now, um, while the smell wafts over you, let me tell you the history of an idea. Everything that you're smelling in here comes from, is made up of atoms that come from what I call the Upper East Side of the periodic table, a nice safe neighborhood. <laughs> um, you, um, you really don't want to leave it if you want to have a career in perfumery. Some people have tried it in the 1920s to add things from the bad parts and it didn't really work. These are the five atoms from which just about everything you're going to smell in real life, um, from coffee to fragrance, uh, are made of. The top note that you smelled at the very beginning, this sort of cut grass green, what we call in perfumery, there are weird terms, uh, and this is, would be called a green note because it smells of something green like cut grass. This is cis-3-hexenol. And um, just, uh, I had to learn uh, chemistry on the fly in the last three years, a very expensive uh, high school chemistry um, education. Um, um, this has a six carbon atoms, so hexahexenol. It has one double bond. It has an alcohol on the end, so it's all, and that's why they call it cis hexenol Once you figure this out, you can really impress people at parties. This smells of cut grass. Now, this is the skeleton of the molecule. If you dress it up with atoms, hydrogen atoms, that's what it looks like when you have it on your computer. But actually, it's sort of more like this, in the sense the atoms have a certain uh, sphere that you cannot penetrate, they repel. Okay, now, why does this thing smell of cut grass, okay? Why doesn't it smell of potatoes or violets? Well, there are really two theories. The first theory is, it must be the shape. And that's a perfectly reasonable theory in the sense that almost everything else in biology works by shape. Enzymes that chew things up, uh, antibodies, it's all, a, you know, the fit between a protein and whatever it is grabbing, in this case, a smell. Um, and I will try and explain to you what's wrong with this notion. And the other theory is that we smell molecular vibrations. Now, this is a totally insane idea. When I first came across it in the early 90s, I thought my predecessor, Malcolm Dyson and Bob Wright, had really taken leave of their senses. And I'll explain to you why this was the case. However, I gradually came to realize they may be right. And I'm still, I have to convince all my colleagues that this is so, but I'm working on it. Um, here's how shape works uh, in, 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 in normal receptors. You have a molecule coming in, it gets into the protein, which is schematic here, and it causes this thing to switch, to turn, to move in some way by binding in certain parts. And the attraction, the forces between the molecule and the protein cause the motion. This is a shape-based idea. Now, what's wrong with shape is summarized in this slide. The way, <laughs> I expect everybody to memorize these compounds. Um, this is one page of work from a chemist's workbook, okay? Working for a fragrance company. He's making 45 molecules and he's looking for a sandalwood, something that smells of sandalwood, because there's a lot of money in sandalwoods. And of these 45 molecules, only 46, 29 actually smells of sandalwood, and he puts an exclamation mark, okay? This is an awful lot of work. This actually is roughly a man years of work 
$200,000 roughly if you keep them on the low salaries with no benefits. So this is a profoundly inefficient process. And my definition of a theory is it's not just something that you teach people, it's labor saving. A theory is something that enables you to do less work. I love the idea of doing less work. So let me explain to you why a very simple fact that tells you why this shape theory really does not work very well. This is cis-3-hexenol. It smells of cut grass. This is cis-3-hexenthiol, and this smells of rotten eggs. Okay? Now, you will have noticed that vodka never smells of rotten eggs. Okay? If it does, you put the glass down, you go to a different bar. Um, this is, um, in other words, we never get the OH, we never mistake it for an SH. Okay, like at no concentration, even pure, you know, if you smell pure ethanol, it doesn't smell of rotten eggs. Conversely, there is no concentration at which the sulfur compound will smell like vodka. It's very hard to explain this by molecular recognition. Now, I showed this to a physicist friend of mine who has a profound distaste for biology. He says, that's easy, the things are a different color. And, uh, uh, <laughs> But we have to go a little beyond that. Now, let me explain why vibrational theory has some sort of interest in it. These molecules, as you saw in the beginning, the building blocks had springs connecting them to each other. In fact, molecules are able to vibrate at a set of frequencies which are very specific for each molecule and for the bonds connecting them. So this is the sound of uh, the OH stretch translated into the audible range. SH, quite a different frequency. Now, this is kind of interesting because it tells you that you should be looking for a particular fact, which is this. Nothing in the world smells like rotten eggs except SH, okay? Now, fact B. Nothing in the world has that frequency except SH. If you look on this imaginary piano keyboard, the SH stretch is in the middle of a part of the keyboard that has been, so to speak, damaged, and there are no neighboring notes. Nothing is close to it. You have a unique smell, unique vibration. So I went searching when I started in this game to convince myself that there was any degree of plausibility to this whole crazy story. I went searching for a type of molecule, any molecule, that would have that vibration and the uh, obvious prediction was that it should absolutely smell of sulfur. If it didn't, the whole idea was toast, and I might as well move on to other things. Now, after searching high and low for several months, I discovered that there was a type of molecule called a borane, which has exactly the same vibration. Now, the good news is boranes you can get hold of. The bad news is they're rocket fuels. Um, they, most of them explode spontaneously in contact with air. And when you call up the companies, they only give you a minimum 10 tons. Okay? <laughs> so, so, so this was not what they call a laboratory scale experiment, and uh, they wouldn't have liked it at my college. Um, however, I managed to get a hold of a, of, a, of, a, of a boring eventually, and here is the beast. And it really does have the same, if you calculate or if you measure the vibrational frequencies, they are the same as SH. Now, does it smell of sulfur? Well, if you go back in the literature, there's a man who knew more about boranes than anyone alive then or since, Alfred Stock. He synthesized all of them. And in an enormous 40-page paper in German, he says at one point, and I'm having, my wife is German, she translated it for me, and at one point he says, ganz widerlich geruch, an absolutely repulsive smell, which is good. Um, reminiscent of hydrogen sulfide. So this fact that boring smell of sulfur had been known since 1910 and utterly forgotten since until 1997, 98. Now, the slight fly in the ointment is this, that if we smell molecular vibrations, we must have a spectroscope in our nose. Now this is a spectroscope, okay? <laughs> on my laboratory bench. And it's fair to say that if you look up somebody's nose, you're unlikely to see anything resembling this. And this was the main objection to the theory. Okay, great, we smell vibrations. How? All right. Now, when people ask this kind of question, they neglect something, which is that physicists are really clever, unlike biologists. And they, two of them... <laughs> this is a joke. I'm a biologist, okay? So it's a joke against myself. Bob Jaklovich and John Lamb at Ford Motor Company, in the days when Ford Motor was spending vast amounts of money on fundamental research, discovered a 
a way to build a spectroscope that was intrinsically nanoscale. In other words, no mirrors, no lasers, no prisms, no nonsense, just a tiny device. And he built this device. And this device uses electron tunneling. Now, I could do the, the dance of electron tunneling, but I've done a video instead. It's much more uh, interesting. Here's how it works. Electrons are fuzzy creatures, and they can jump across gaps, but only at equal energy. If the energy differs, they can't jump, it's unlike us, they won't fall off the cliff. Okay. Now, if something absorbs the energy, the electron can travel. So here you have a system, you have something, and there's plenty of that stuff in biology, some substance giving an electron, and the electron tries to jump, and only when a molecule comes along that has the right vibration does the reaction happen. Okay? This is the basis for the device that these two guys at Ford built. And every single part of this mechanism is actually plausible in biology. In other words, I've taken off-the-shelf components and I've made a spectroscope. What's nice about this idea, if you, if you have a philosophical bent of mind, is that then it tells you that the nose, the ear, and the eye are all vibrational senses. Of course, it doesn't matter because it could also be that they're not, but it has a certain... <laughs> It has a certain ring to it, which is, which is, which is attractive to, to people who read too much uh, uh, 19th century German literature. <laughs> and then a magnificent thing happened. I left academia and joined the real world of business. And a company was created around my ideas to make new molecules using my method, along the lines of, let's put someone else's money where your mouth is. And, <laughs> and one of the first things that happened was, we started going around the fragrance companies asking for what they needed because, of course, if you can calculate smell, you don't need chemists, you need a computer. A Mac will do it if you know how to program the thing right, okay? So you can, you can try a thousand molecules, you can try 10,000 molecules in, in a weekend, and then you only tell a chemist to make the right one. And so that's a direct path to making new odorants. And one of the first things that happened was we went to see some perfumers in France, and here's where I do my Charles Fleischer impression. And one of them says, you cannot make a coumarine, he says to me. <laughs> I bet you cannot make a coumarine. Now, coumarine is a very common thing, uh, a material <laughs> in fragrance, which is derived from a bean that comes from South America, and it is the classic synthetic aroma chemical. Okay? It's the molecule that has made men's fragrances smell the way they do since 1881, to be exact. And the problem is, it's a carcinogen. So nobody likes particularly to, you know, aftershave <laughs> with carcinogens. <laughs> there are some reckless people, but it's not worth it. Okay? So they asked us to make a new coumarin. And so we started doing calculations. And the first thing you do is you calculate the vibrational spectrum of coumarin and you smooth it out so that you have a nice a picture of what the, the sort of chord, so to speak, of coumarin is. And then you start cranking the computer to find other molecules, related or unrelated, that have the same vibrations. And we actually, in this case, I'm sorry to say, it happened, it was serendipitous because um, I got a phone call from our chief chemist and he said, look, I just found this such a beautiful reaction that even if this compound doesn't smell of coumarin, I want to do it. It's just such a nifty uh, one step. I mean, chemists have weird, weird minds. One step, 90% yield, you know, and you get this lovely crystalline compound. Let us try it. And I said, well, first of all, let me do the calculation on that compound, bottom right, which is related to coumarin but has an extra pentagon inserted into the molecule. Calculate the vibrations. The purple spectrum is that new fella. The white one is the old one. And prediction is it should smell of coumarin. They made it. And it smelled exactly like coumarin. And this is our new baby called Tonkin. You see, when you're a scientist, you're always selling ideas. And people are very resistant to ideas. And rightly so. Why, sh why should new ideas be accepted? But when you put a little 10 gram vial on the table in front of perfumers, and it smells like coumarin, and it isn't coumarin, and you found it in three weeks, this focuses everybody's mind wonderfully. <laughs> uh, okay. And 
people often ask me, is your theory accepted? And I said, well, by whom? I mean, most, you know, there's three attitudes. You're right and I don't know why, which is the most rational one at this point. You're right and I don't care uh, how you do it, in a sense, you bring me the molecules, you know, and you're completely wrong and I'm sure you're completely wrong, okay? Now, we're dealing with people who only want results, uh, and this is the commercial world, and they tell us that even if we do it by astrology, they're happy, <laughs> okay? We're not actually doing it by astrology. Um, but for the last three years, I've had what I consider to be the best job in the entire universe, which is to put my hobby, which is, you know, fragrance and all the magnificent things, plus a little bit of biophysics, a small amount of self-taught chemistry at the service of something that actually works. Thank you very much. <laughs>